Psalm 139, please. Psalm 139. Um, I wonder, as you were singing that this morning, is that, is that the cry of your heart? Wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. Psalm 139 and down to verse 22, please. And then we're going over into the New Testament and First John. And as I read these verses, and as we read them together, I want you to make this your heart's prayer this morning. These last two verses of Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any way, wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, I would probably say that's one of the most staggering prayers that you could ever pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Come with me over to the New Testament, please. Just before you come to the book of Revelation, you'll come to First, First John. First John and chapter 2, please. Cast in your eye at verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now listen to this. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar, and his truth is not in him. Turn with me over to chapter 3, please, and down to verse number 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Down to verse 14. And we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Verse 22. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask of him, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And we know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow with me one moment as we ask the Lord for his help this morning. And you ask the Lord to speak to you. Make that your prayer this morning. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Father, we just come again before thee in attitude of prayer, and we thank thee for the open word of God before us. And Lord, we just cry now in the moments that we have that, Lord, that thou wilt draw graciously near. And Father, we want you to remove everything from our minds, everything from our attention, Lord, that would steal our thoughts away from what thou would have to say to us. And so, Lord, we come as a band of people and we surrender to thee, we yield to thee. And we would say, like Samuel of old, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. 
And Lord, we come against the enemy tonight, this morning, the unseen foes. And Lord, we cry the precious covering of the blood over this meeting. We pray, Lord, that there'll be no distraction or hindrances, Lord, that will have any foothold in our gathering. And so, Lord, I just come before thee as a weak, empty vessel. And I pray, Lord, that thou will fill me and endue me with that oil from heaven. And Lord, you know the burden on our heart this morning. We pray that thou will help us to deliver it in a way that is godly and gentle and tender. And above all, that thy Son would get all of the glory. We ask it in the precious and worthy name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. There's three things that God looks for and requires in all of his people. Not only collectively, but individually. And I would go as far as saying, dear friend, one of the great reasons why we in the West are in the state that we're in, one of the great reasons why the church is in the state that it's in this morning is because of the lack of these three vital components. The first is humility. Humility. You remember it was Peter, he said, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Let me say that again. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. It was Solomon, the son of David, who pain pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Every single one of us in this meeting this morning, saint and sinner alike, we're contaminated by pride. Indeed we are. Wasn't it Paul, whenever he said to the church at Philippi, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. That was the downfall of Lucifer, the son of the morning, the most beautiful being that God ever made. He said, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will be like the Most High. That was the downfall of Saul, the first king of Israel. It was the downfall of godly King Uzziah and Hezekiah. And over many this morning, even across our land, you could write that awesome text, how the mighty are fallen because of pride. Micah, he said in Micah 6, What doth God require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy? and to walk humbly with thy God. And I would say this morning from a heart that has been alone with the Lord much this week, if you or I are contaminated and controlled by a haughty spirit, what we need to do is flee to our knees and repent and get alone with God. Not only does God require humility, but he requires harmony. Harmony. That was the great problem in the church at Corinth. They had a gift. They had ability. They had plenty of teaching. But there was strife and contention and division among them. And the cry of the apostles' heart was this. Let there be no division among you. Wasn't that the problem at the church at Philippi? Whenever Paul, he named two women, Eutychus and Syntyche, two women that were at loggerheads, two women that wouldn't speak, two women that wouldn't shake hands, two women that wouldn't look at one another. Heard a story recently of a woman who was in a missionary meeting. And the missionary was pleading for souls 
believers to, to head out to the mission field, to go out and win the loss for the Lord over in Africa. And Mary, she stood to her feet and she said, Lord, I'm willing to go to Africa. And s- some brother stood behind her and says, but you're not willing to go across the pew and shake hands with Anne that you haven't looked at for three years. And I want to confront this morning. I want to confront you and I believe God wants to search all of our hearts. Have we got anything in our heart again, another brother in this meeting? Is there a brother or sister when we see them coming that we will avoid them? We will take a quick exit into the the bathroom or we'll head into some other area of the hall just to avoid their company. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This is what the Lord Jesus said. He said, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee. It doesn't matter if you have something against him. Has he got anything against you? He said, if you remember there that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way and first be reconciled to thy brother. Then come and offer thy gift. It was there in Psalm 133 where David penned how blessed it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. He said it was like the oil, that special ointment that couldn't be manufactured by man. It was like the dew from heaven that landed and rested upon the mountains and the hills of Herm. God requires humility. God requires harmony. But I tell you, dear friends, what has been burning in my heart all week is God requires, now listen to this, holiness. Holiness. That's the reason why God saved us. God did not save us to have a nice time or have a good time. God did not save us to do whatever we want. God did not save us to live in the troughs of the world of sin and of depravity. It says in first, first Ephesians chapter 1, that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. Holy. There's something that's offensive about that word. And it often offends our heart whenever we realize that God has a standard for us to live. God has a standard. Peter, he said these words, He said, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Let me say that again. As he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all of your conversation. Not just some. Not just on a Sunday. Not just whenever you come around believers, whenever you're in the workplace, that's where he wants you to be holy. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Paul went on to say in 2 Corinthians, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And friend, let me say this to you this morning from a broken and a burdened heart. One of the great lacks among us as a people of God is that we no longer fear him. We no longer fear him. We no longer fear the creator. We no longer fear the the upholder of all things. We no longer tremble. We no longer shake as we come into his house. The fear, the fear of God. The reason why I say holiness is so missing among us. This is what the writer to the Hebrews said. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. 
And if you're in this meeting or listening to me today and you haven't got a holy life, let me say this to you from the word of God. You're not saved. You're not saved. Without it, no man shall see the Lord. And this is what you'll say on the day when you stand before your creator. This is the words that you'll say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Did we not do many wonderful works in thy name? Then will I profess unto them. Then will I profess unto them. I never knew. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And that's why Paul, after his two epistles to the church at Corinth, this is how he closes. He said, examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourself. And friend, let me say this. I know there's many of you here have burdens with your family and burdens with your health. But oh, I say to you this morning, those of you that are not living a holy life, you make sure that you've got saved. You make sure that you have it. You make sure that you have it. Because the devil will deceive you all of your life just if he can damn your soul. We have a holy Bible. We worship a holy God. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so we're required as God's people to be a holy people. And one of the greatest problems, if not the greatest problem that God has in the world today is not the homosexual. No, no. The great problem that God has is not with adultery. Or it's not with the alcoholic or the drug addict. But the great problem that God has in the world today is not the sin in the world, it's a sin in the church. And I know I'll not have many friends after this, friends, but I have to be faithful to God. Leonard Raven, he said, we're so impure that God can't use us. We're so impure that God cannot use us. I was talking to my mother the other night, and this is what my mother said. We've pointed our finger at the world for long enough. We've pointed our finger at the world for long enough. We have lost our hatred for sin. We have lost that burning desire in our heart to live a clean, a holy, and a pure life. You see, we see sin just as a little obstacle. But every time you and I as believers sin, every time we do our own will, every time we disobey God, we offend the heart of our Savior. And if you want to know how serious sin is, stand and gaze at Calvary. Stand and gaze at the one who died for you and me. Stand and gaze at the one who was stripped naked, nailed to a cross. Oh, why did he do it? For me and for you. J.C. Ryle said the first mark of a holy life is a man or woman that hates sin. And I want to ask you a question this morning from the heart of God. Do you hate it? Do you hate it? This is what the apostle said. He said, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. You'll read the story way back in Judges 4. You'll read of a woman and she takes an eel. Her name is Jael. And there's an ungodly man, an ungodly king by the name of Sisera comes into her tent to seek refuge. And this is what Jezeel does. She takes a nail from out of the tent and she takes a hammer and she nails him to the ground. And friend, let me say this to you this morning. Man, mother, father, daughter, if you're in this meeting and you're living in willful sin, you need to nail it. You need to nail it. Before it nails you. 
and she took the nail and she took the hammer when without any compromise, she nailed it. Oh, friend, let me say this to you again. And I say it not boastfully, but as a man that's been before God this, this week, I wonder, have you got anything to nail in your life? Anything to nail? Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So often we can use the grace and the mercy of God just like a mat. And we can go through our sin and we can come back and we can repent and we can, we can do it again and we can repent and we get before the Lord and it's just a cycle of round and round and round again. Friend, God never saved you to be like that. God never saved you out of the world to live a life of failure. He never saved you to live a life of defeat. This is what Peter said. It is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's true. It's time. We're living in a world that's going to a lost eternity. We're living in a world that laughs at the things of God. We're living in a world that just seems to belittle us and make fun of us. And judgment must begin at the house of God. A man said to me during the week, as believers, we have failed. Friend, let me tell this to you this morning. We have failed. We have failed. There's a world that's dying. The world is dying. And so often I meet it on the door, I'm not going to become a believer because I see what that person does. I'm not going to get saved because that woman down the road, she professes to be a Christian and see what she does. Search me, O oh God. God's searching you this morning. God searched me during the week. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You see, we categorize them, don't we? If we seen a man or woman and they were living a moral sin, we would say, boys, oh dear, did you see that? If we see a man and he's caught in the act of some immorality, oh, I'll never be near that boy again. But always remember this, friends. The Lord Jesus didn't judge the act. He judged the motive. He said, if a man looketh upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery already in his heart, long before he lay with her, long before he took her, he has already committed adultery in his heart. He said, if a brother hates another brother, he's committed murder. And we read it tonight, this morning. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. That's strong words. Strong words. But this is what the word of God says. Why do we categorize it? God doesn't. Because he said these very awesome words in James, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of them all. Guilty. And that's why I can say to you this morning, we've pointed at the world long enough. Is it not time we started to look inward? Is it not time we started to look at our own lives and examine our own heart? And to know if there be any wicked way in me. There's a lovely verse in Proverbs that says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I don't know what's in your heart this morning. I don't know what you're thinking as you sit and listen to me. Maybe you're saying, who is he to preach like this? Who does he think he is? But, oh, friend, let me say this to you this morning. I don't know your heart and you don't know mine. But God knows. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And nothing more. Solomon went all to say, he said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the, all the issues of life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. John Owen, that great Puritan of a bygone day, said we need to be sore on our own sin. Let me say that again. We need to be sore on our own sin. Every doubtful practice, 
we need to put away. Now, I'm coming close this morning. And I, I say again, friends, I'm not preaching this message to preach it anyone. The Lord knows my heart. And that's one of the prayers that I have been praying. Lord, don't th- let these people think that I am preaching at them. Don't let them think, Lord, that I am being arrogant or hard or harsh. But I want to ask you a question. Is there anything doubtful in your life? Is there? Is there any area of your life, if I was to see it or if others were to see it, you would be totally disgusted? Some little, some little sideward sin. Some little hobby and way that you, you relax and switch off. And every time you do it, it condemns your heart. And this is what the Word of God says, and we read it this morning. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, who knoweth all things. If our hearts condemn us, does your heart condemn you this morning? Does it? Well, I can't create an anxious thought. And if you're condemned in this meeting, it has to be the Spirit of God that takes a dealing with us. I'm not preaching this morning sinless perfection. It's not possible to be sinless, but let me say this. It's possible not to sin. It's possible to get into that place with the Lord where you grieve and you hate your very sin that wounds the heart of the Savior. And you say, Lord, will you give me victory over this thing? Whether it's gossip, whether it's pornography, whether it's lust, whether it's unforgiveness or bitterness. God can deliver you. He can give you a clean hands and he can give you a pure heart. That's the gospel. You remember whenever the woman that was caught in adultery came to the Lord in John 8, this is what the Lord said. He said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. We read in John chapter, one, John chapter 2 and verse 1, the little children, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. Don't do it. Isn't that the great mighty gospel text we often preach it that he should be called Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin? And I feel this morning that's why we, we've accommodated our sin for so long. We just take it as part of life that we'll just let the Lord down every day. Friend, the world, the Lord never meant us to live like that. Indeed, he didn't. He wants to lift us up into the new plane where he gives us victory and joy and power. And I say it again, and I said it the last Sunday morning I was here. That's why many people don't pray. Because whenever they go to pray, their heart condemns them. That's why many people don't go through with the Lord because their heart condemns them. Every time you open your mouth to praise the Lord or to thank Him. Your mind goes back to that little secret act. Your mind goes back to that area in your life that's doubtful. And if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. It's big stuff, isn't it? And I get no delight out of preaching this, I can assure you. But I can hear someone say this morning, I can see here someone cry from the pew, Stephen, have you forgot the verse in Romans 8 and 1? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But always remember the last part of the verse. To those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And if you're in this meeting or if you're listening to me, no matter where you are along the road of life, if your desires are for the world and for sin, This verse doesn't apply to you. It says there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk after, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I can hear someone else say, Stephen, have you forgot about the mighty verse in John 1? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, it cleanses us from all of our sin. Indeed it does. But always remember the start of the verse. 
It says if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all of our sins. I can hear someone say, have you forgot about 1 John 1 and 9? He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our sin. Ah, but friend, always remember the, the start of the verse. It says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, just you, don't you worry about the person beside you this morning. Just you turn off now. God's something to say to you. One of the great burdens the Lord has laid on our heart during the week is that we need to rediscover again the seriousness of sin. We need to rediscover again what sin looks like through the eyes of God. And even as believers, while our soul is saved and while we're going on to heaven, we can lose fellowship. We can lose communion with him. And we need to get a fresh vision of the, the holiness of God. Friend, if God was to come into this meeting this morning, every single one of us would be prostrate on our face. There's only one attribute of God that is chanted throughout the annals of history. You know what it is? Holy. 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 And that's why I say to you this morning, we need to rediscover the seriousness of sin in the eyes of God. Many of the gospel verses that we use and I use, and we direct them to the unsaved. If you take them in their context, God was directing to his people. Now listen to this. Uh, friend, let me say this to you. There's nothing that annoys a man on a pulpit more whenever you don't listen to him. Now you listen to me this morning. Because we don't do this lightly. This message will come before me in eternity again. And it'll come before you again. And every single one of us will give an account of what you've heard this morning. One of the verses that we preach to the unsaved is, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. And I say to some man in the meeting or woman, Whatever you be doing, or listen to me, whatever you're doing and no one else knows about, this is a promise from God. Be sure. Be sure. Be dead sure. Your sin will find you. You see, we can hide it like Achan. We can deny it like David. We can run from it like Moses. But be sure. Be sure your sin will find you out. Wasn't that what happened to Saul? Saul, the mighty king of Israel, he, he disobeyed the Lord. And this is what Samuel said. He said, what meaneth it by the bleating of the sheep and the lowing of the cattle? And Saul was found out. And I can look back to days in my life. Days as a younger believer back 10 years ago. Whenever I used to be involved in willful sin and used to sit down in that little pew, but I tell you, dear friends, I can say from the authority of the Word of God, my sin found me out. Did it did. And no matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, if you're living in willful sin, be sure. Be sure your sin will find you out. What about Galatians? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What about Proverbs 5, 21? The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his going. Amos 5 and 12, he says, I know your transgressions. I know them, he said. 
and your mighty sin. And I say again, as believers, if we're trying to live a double life, if we're trying to hide from God, we're, one, we're, losing, a, we're losing a battle. He says, I know your transgressions and your mighty sin. Is that not why we're dead this morning? Is that why we're not seeing souls saved? Is that why the world's laughing and mocking at us? We no longer have the standard of the word of God, of living a pure and holy and a clean life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. One of the saddest statements in the word of God was said by Saul. He said, I have played the fool. I have played the fool. How are you playing the fool this morning? Honestly now. I have played the fool. And God found him out. So you can see the seriousness of sin. And you can see the holiness of God. And if our hearts condemn us, God, he is greater than our hearts who knoweth all. And as I close, and I only take a few minutes, I want to leave before you three sins that are found in the New Testament church that burned into my heart during the week. The first one, and don't turn to it, is in Acts chapter 5. It was there where Ananias and Sapphira, it says that they sold a possession of ground and they kept back part of the price. And I want to say again with the authority of the word of God, what is it you're keeping back? What is it? Are you keeping back your time? Keeping back your tithe? Keeping back some area of your life that the Lord longs to have control of? The business, the money, the bank account, they kept back part of the price. But it wasn't the fact that they kept it back. Now listen to this. It was the fact that they pretended that they had gave everything. And they came to Peter and they, they laid the money before him. And this is what Peter said. How is it that Satan has filled thine heart to lie against God? That's big stuff, friends. These were professing believers. And they kept back part of the price and they pretended that they'd give it all. You know what the big sin is that the Lord has laid in my heart? They were living a lie. They were living a lie. They were pretending. They knew the hymns and they knew the verses. Oh, they would have said, Amen, brother, hallelujah. Oh, brother, preach it. But whenever God knocked on their door, be sure your sin has found you. And they were just making a performance. Now, does not not convict all of our heart here this morning? I know it convicts mine. We all know how to perform, don't we? Don't we? We know how to pray in a prayer meeting that we can get an amen and a hallelujah. And every time that Stephen Riddle has done it in there, it's been obnoxious in the eyes of God. Just a performance. And here was two men, a man and a wife, and they were just, they were playing along. Friend, and you know what happened to them? They died in the meeting. They died in the meeting. And I've been asking myself during the week, is the Lord any different this morning? Come on now. Do you think if we're here this morning and we're just playing along that they'll treat you and I any different? Did he not? They went out into eternity. Stephen Alford, that great preacher of a bygone day, was preaching a message not far away from this. 
And there was a man in the meeting and he was, Amen, hallelujah. Oh, he says, preach it, brother, preach it. And Stephen Alford began to bore down in the meeting and press in on sin. And the same man got out of his seat and stormed out through the door. And one of the ushers got him at the door. And he was living in the most vilest inf- of immorality. Performance. And every single one of us are guilty of that. And this couple, they died in the presence of the Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And I'm going to ask you a wee question. Are you a performer? Are you a performer? Is it all just a show? Do you pray different in a prayer meeting than you do at home? Do you look different today than you do any other day? Is it all a show? They were living a lie. And they died in the presence of God. Big stuff. The second big sin that I have been convicted about is found in Revelation chapter 2. And it's the church at Ephesus. The Lord said, he said, I know your works and your labors. They had the right doctrine. They had the right truth. They were active in the assembly. But this is what he said. You've left your first love. Now I want to ask, is there any backsliders here this morning? I want you to listen to me. Can you look back to a day in your life where you were closer to the Lord than what you are now? Can you look back to a day in your life where you enjoy in the word of God and the place of prayer more than you are now? And this is the words that come from the Lord to you this morning. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Didn't lose it. He says you left it. I was wondering, did they leave it for money? Did they leave it for popularity or did they leave it for fame or leave it for some relationship? I don't know what they left it for, but I'm asking you, what did you leave it for? Some of you young people here this morning, and I remember you praying over in that bar night and day. You don't do it now. You've left your first love. There's some believers here and I have never heard you in my all of my life praying in a prayer meeting. Left your first love. There's some people, believers across this land uh, and they're not even out in an assembly this morning. Left your first love. And we can cover all that over, friends, with nice language and amens and verses and cliches and hymns and poems. But search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. Have you left your first love? This is what the Lord Jesus, he said. He says, remember from whence thou art fallen. Remember. Remember the good days. Remember the days when you used to enjoy the word of God. He says, remember. And then he says, repent. And then he goes on to say, or else I'll remove. That's serious. You see, the word of God says that there's a sin that is unto death. This is not a game, friends. John, in his epistle, he said that there's a sin that a believer can commit and the Lord will deal with him so harshly that he'll die. In fact, that's what happened in the church at Corinth. He said, for this reason, some are sick and some are weakly and some even sleep. They died. And it's only the grace of God that this preacher's before you this morning. 
For there's many times I have played a performance, and there's many times when I have left my first love. Not only is her living a lie and leaving our first love, finally, there's being lukewarm. It says in Revelation chapter 3, the Lord Jesus speaking himself of the church at Laodicea, I know thy works. Mother, I know your work. Man or woman that goes over to the barn, I know your work. Oh, he knows it all right. Sunday school teachers, I know your work. Preachers and deacons and elders, I know your work. But thou art neither hot nor cold. And I would that thou art cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Friend, does that not convict every one of us? Whenever I read those verses during the week, you know what I did? I put my head between my knees and crawled in a ball and got down and says, God forgive me. God forgive me. And there's so many of us and we think that we're better than others and further along the road than other believers and more spiritual than others. And the Lord says, you're neither hot nor cold. And he says, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. The fire's gone. The tears have gone. The passion's gone. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And while I am dying, oh, how glad I will be if the lamp of my life has been burnt out for thee. Now I'm holding you back from your dinner. I know that. But friend, there's coming a day when every one of us will stand and give an account of himself to the Lord. He'll not give an account. We will. I will. He says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Repent. Repent. Those of us this morning that are living a lie, repent. Those of us this morning that are lukewarm, repent. Those of us that have left our first love, he says, repent. Or else, or else I'll remove. D.L. Moody said, I think we Christians have a good deal of sin to confess. I firmly believe that until we do so, we will not see any great work of God among us. Oh, friends, that convicts my soul this morning. Now, turn with me to John chapter 1, and I'm going to read this, and then we're going to bow in a moment of prayer. 1 John chapter 1. And if your heart has condemned you, God is greater than our heart, who knoweth all things, but in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, this is what the Word of God says. This then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of our sins. If we say that we have no sin, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Listen to this. If we confess our sin, oh, thank God he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. My job's over. My burden has been released. The message has been given. And if your heart has condemned you the way it has me during the week, 
There's only one place where I can point. And that is, there is a green hill far away, outside the city wall, where the dear Lord was crucified, and he died to save us all. But friends, this is what we need. Before we see a move of God, we need to be honest and open and transparent and real. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Let us pray. Just still our hearts for a moment. We haven't preached this message to condemn anyone. We've been preaching it at ourselves. But friend, if the Lord has laid his finger on any area of your life, don't leave this meeting until you get right with God. Father, we just bow before thee, and Lord, you know how we have wrestled and fought with thee. Lord, we didn't really want to bring this message this morning, but we have to be faithful. And Lord, I just pray now that, Lord, thou will deal with every one of us. Lord, that thou wilt raise us up to be a band of men and women, not only here, but across this land that is marked by humility, marked by a people that are uh, holy and people that are in harmony. And Father, that we will see the power of God come. Lord, I want to be real this morning. I'm tired of a facade. We're tired of show, Lord. We want to see the real thing. So, Lord, we ask, Thou will part us, and as we gather around the table, we pray as our minds go to Calvary. And think of what all our sin did to the Son of God. Oh, it ought to put that holy reverence in our heart. Pray that Thou will part us now, in the precious name of Thy Son. Amen.